Hi, my name is Richard Bilderbeek. I'm a postdoc in the group of Orsa Johansson at Uppsala University. And I would like to talk about quantitative trade prediction using GCAE. This presentation can be found here. This is the license. So I want a couple of weeks, uh, only a week ago, um, in Science there was a new article about that the whole human genome has been sequenced. Um, that, that's not in science, but if you read the general headline, they say it's the whole genome. And we already heard that in the news, that the whole genome had been sequenced. And I think it was Bill Clinton who said that. That's not completely true already then, and it is not now. The first time only, between quotes, 92% had been sequenced. Now they sequenced everything except for five regions. But regardless, we like to know more about our genome, uh, our genotype, and one of the things we like to do with it is to make predictions with it. And that is exactly what my research is about. Where we used the, the whole genome sequences of 950 individuals approximately from a health study, the North Swedish Population Health Study. And we're going to predict their phenotypes, which is approximately 400 protein concentrations in blood, using some kind of machine learning technique that has something completely new to it. And we want to see how well it performs uh, on its own as well as compared to others. So the method to do that is called GCAE, where GCAE is an abbreviation of Genomic Convolutional Auto Encoder. And it's made by Carl Netterblad and Christina Ausmees, um, also both in Uppsala. And the goal of such a thing is to do dimensionality reduction. So I'll briefly touch this image. Uh, it's the one you find on Wikipedia, that's why I picked it. If you have an original image, you can want you can extract the most vital things from it. Ideally you want that. Um, because it allows you to, to grab the essence of, of, of an image. And you can do that, for example, simply using principal components analysis. Uh, because by definition, it extracts the dimensions with the most variance. It does so. so and, and from that first principal component, it subtracts that from the original image, then looks for the second dimension with the highest variation, and so on and so on. So it reduces dimension into these principal components. A feature of those principal components is that this is a linear process between the components. It first looks for one component, subtracts that after finding it, and then does this all again and again and again. And you can see that the original image, it has been, it has had a gist of what it was. It has compressed the image, it has reduced the dimensions of that image. But getting it back is, is noisy, as you can expect. Like getting the gist out of an image is hard enough of a problem. But would, would when they used an auto encoder, which allows to do more or less the same, it will learn how to do principal component analysis more or less. But now the components are can be non-linearly related, and you see that it does a, a better job in for these images. So let's zoom in more on autoencoders and how they look like. So here I have a schematic of an autoencoder. It's a type of neural network that has a big input layer, a bottleneck layer, also called a latent layer, and an output layer. And what it learns to do is if you feed it, you, you train it to compress the data. So if, for example, you feed it an image of a shoe, and the shoe has a lot of pixels, and that's, that's why it's a big layer, and it gets compressed, and com there will be way fewer and fewer neurons to store uh, that information, and then it goes through the bottleneck layer, which may be two neurons big. And then it decodes, and again, so the first process is called encoding, and th after the bottleneck layer it's called de uh, decoding, and it is trained to do this process well. So if you put in a shoe, it should give back a shoe. If you put in a shirt, it should give back a shirt. And the latent layer contains the dimension reduced data. And this allows you to, for example, if there's noise in one of those images, to still properly 
reconstruct those and of course you get um, you do need to train it it needs to learn how to do it but it can do it without humans you just feed it a lot of images and should reconstruct it using well the pixel distance in a way but um, this is what an autoencoder does but this is just pictures let's take this to genetic information so in this case we put in genotypes and these genotypes are very long uh, we use whole genome sequences so that's approximately 3 billion nucleotides and we compress it down and down and down and then we decode it again and the idea is to reconstruct the genotypes now for genotypes why does that make sense well this makes sense because if we want to order genotypes we want to have the genotypes that are closest to one another that are probably more related to one another closer by and just by the number but by using an alphabet using alphabetic ordering doesn't doesn't cut it there and it's a bit similar to uh, I'll use an analogy here to books so here we have a lot of books they have letters in them and what we can do uh, what would be useful is that we could put them into um, genres that's what humans do we put humans uh, we put books in genres so we maybe put uh, genre um, uh, genotypes in populations or uh, related individuals so here we put bo books in genres this is the Uppsala library where I am now and the idea is um, is to if we can group our genotypes in a way that makes sense we can do useful things we can see uh, and I'll show you in the next slide but also one of the things you can use ancient DNA to fill in the gaps that's one one reason why they develop GCA and this GCA it's a neural network it's a convolutional neural network it's an autoencoder um, so this is it in, d in full glory and detail which I won't go in too much except the input layers here uh, bottleneck layers there output layers there there are some tricks here to speed up learning won't go into that um, but this is what I'll zoom in a, a bit so the bottleneck layer has only two neurons which means it will reduce the genotype to two-dimensional data but also the two layers before it and the two layers after it have 75 neurons that means that you that there's a lot of tuning that needs to be going on and you can imagine if I only put in very simple data let's say only one SNP then this whole machinery gathers so many noise on its own that it can't reproduce a single SNP there needs to be there needs to be something to be challenging here else else there will be too much noise and I'll, I'll show you in a bit when that happens so how did it perform so in the original article here they used uh, 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 I think this is snips yeah they used a ferromatic snip maybe they use a lot of snips I think 10,000 per person and they used thousands of persons from different countries and um, so every point you see here is a person the color and shape denote it's his or her country and if you do principal components and as you get this typical V shape where Africa is here Asia is there and Europe is in between and you see that this is not a very nice reduction because also America is here as well um, it, this is not a very clean separation ideally and that's what GCA does you get a separation like this where every continent has its own spot every country has its own spot and the further they are apart the more genetically they are apart this is excellent uh, to find this so we can see that GCA can nicely put g order genotypes can cluster genotypes so can put them in the right genres can put them in the right population and um, one thing it cannot do is, is, is rare alleles so GCA can extract the gist or the essence of these genotypes but if there are genotypes that have a rare allele that only exists for example once it will not reconstruct it and you can see that especially the bottom left of the graph um, like if we have an allele that's in the data set let's say um, a half of the times then most of the time it will 
output it a bit more often than than, than you would hope for, but it, but it's good enough uh, probably because extracting the gist out of genotypes is hard enough as it is. But here, this left column, and it's a, it's of course it's it's too hard to see it exactly. Uh, but the left hand column means that these are SNPs that have a true allele frequency from low to 0.8 and they are never reconstructed, they, are never, they never reach the output layer again. So these are the victims of, of generalization. So you know GCAA cannot do rare alleles, well, which is fine, like you want to do generalizations, not uh, reconstruct everything. The new thing is, and that, that's where I come into the picture, is we added uh, an extension to do trait prediction. So here we have the autoencoder, and on the latent layer, uh, Carl added uh, another neural network that uses the latent layer's input, and the output will be the predicted quantitative trait. And this is new, and uh, I'll share, show with an analogy why this may make sense. I'll be using books again. So the analogy is that unordered genotypes are like, like stacks of books and ordered genotypes are like in a library. And I'll extend the analogy to say that protein concentrations, the analogy for, for that is to predict the number of horses or spaceships in the book. If you have ordered those books in a way that makes sense, like the science fiction department will, will already know will have more spaceships in it and the, the books about nature will have more horses in them. So in that way intuitively I feel it makes sense but we still don't know. So how do we know and what has been done? Well what has been done is so we have a GCE8 autoencoder, there's an R package I made around it and I made a collection of bash scripts around it. Um, so GCEA can now actually run with trait prediction that it could not run um, at the start but I made it run and can now run on Bianca thanks to a singularity container I made. The R package GCEAR calls the autoencoder which is t and it's tested to be correct it gives proper error messages and it extended the functionality so it's a more stricter version and also an extended version also that one has a singularity container and then we have uh, the, the collection of bash scripts noise Swiss population health study machine learning quantitative trait those are just scripts that I've tested and reused in many contexts I can't test them because most of it is in um, in the R package anyway so it has been indirectly tested but I use them in many contexts so I, if there's something wrong um, I'm likelier to find it. And this works locally or on our clusters RACAM uh, or on our internet access denied cluster Bianca as well. This is for sensitive data. Um, so that, that means that you can't do anything with internet on Bianca because it contains sensitive data. Um, so you really need your a singularity container to do something fancy there. Also, you can run these scripts today, they're here on GitHub. Actually, this, th this slide is most of the work, but let's go back to the science. What I did is a, a first simple experiment. Uh, the code is, here you see the Rackham script. And I wanted to simulate the simplest possible data set. I run GCA as is, and I evaluate its performance. And this has proven to be insightful and we'll learn something about our autoencoder. So here I've put the full data set. I used Plinker, an R package to work with Plink. Here's how I generated it. And um, I simulated one monogenic trait that is fully heritable. Um, so there's no, no environmental effect at all. I simulated a thousand individuals and the minor allele had a frequency of 0.4999 that's as close to 0.5 as you can get for a minor allele and these are the bad bim and fam file and these are the phenotype file um so the fin so so uh, so there's one snip 
one snip, major allele A, minor allele C. It's a chromosome that's, that's irrelevant. Um, the FAM file is completely random, it just shows five people that are all similar, and the phenotype is defined in the V file there. And here we have the bad file, it's usually binary with Plinker can you can see it. And then we can see if you have a genotype of zero, which means you have both the major alleles, then your phenotypic trait will be approximately nine. If you're heterozygous, you have six. If you're homozygous for the rare allele, you have three. Um, so the question is, of course, why did I not use 0, 1, and 2 for trait values? We can think about this a couple of seconds. Because what I, what I done did is, how well can Plink do this? So I used Plinker again to do this easily. Um, and Plinker, he found, found that there's definitely an association between the genotype and the phenotype. The effect size is minus 3 approximately. Uh, which is exactly how it was simulated. So you see I use um, an effect size of pi, uh, minus pi in this case, because if I would use zeros, ones and twos, this would not be a quantitative trait analysis, but it would be a case control analysis. So Plink builds that in uh, and you can't turn it off, you can't overrule it to say hey this is a quantitative trait of zeros, ones and twos. Um, so that's why I use pi. So what did I expect from the phenotypic prediction? Well, I expected a lot. So the true phenotype was size of pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. Um, this is the line of identity, y equals x. And ideally, if the true phenotype is pi, then the predicted phenotype will be pi as well. Same here, same here. I expect some noise in the machinery, that's all fine. Uh, this is what I expected. but when I ran it, it's not what I got. You see that when the true phenotype is pi, it, it predicts a higher phenotype. For 2 pi, more or less right, but for 3 pi, it again overestimates. The predicted predicts a higher value than I put in. So, how can it be? So, I'm just thinking about that, and I think that. So I would say the proof of concept it works. That's nice to get this to, to get this going. It was very easy to write. It's just this script running this script it does everything you need. But the prediction is underperforming, and the hypothesis is that you should not use this. Is not the 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 shape of our autoencoder actually. What I f would say is that because you put in one snip. The shape is different, it's more like a figure of 8 instead of uh, hourglass. Because we put in one snip, then it gets extended into many, many layers, also these 75, two layers of 75 nozzles after here. So there's, there's just noise being added everywhere for just one single snip. So I would say that the neural network is underwhelmed, it's not challenged to, be, to do anything useful. That's what I would say. So that's a hypothesis, and we can test that. Um, but we won't, because we could tune the network to the problem by, by trying a simpler one and figuring out how GCA works then. Um, that will be insightful for, for that will be insightful in a way, but instead we try to we decide to tune the problem to the network by trying harder problems, and this focuses more on the application of the thing, uh, which makes sense. So next experiment was to run, uh, to use the North and Swedish population health study, a real data set with, uh, with one protein concentration, and to see how it worked. So we picked uh, 100,000 random SNPs, this is a whole genome, data, whole genome sequence data, so uh, 1 in 3,000 SNPs I guess, and we used the constraint protein concentration of adrenomedulin, which is also here in 3D. And um, from that, uh, we picked from those random variants, we tried to predict the concentration of adrenomedulin. We just ran GCA as is, and then we evaluated the performance. So maybe, if you know this data set, or actually this is very general as well, can you predict the performance already? So we used a hundred thousand random SNPs, and we used adrenomedulin. 
Well, I'll show you now how the performance looks like. So here you have the true phenotype. At the y-axis we have the predicted phenotype. And ideally the identity line should be diagonal. And all the points should lie on it. That's, I that's ideal. Instead the identity line goes up vert and close to vertically, like it appears vertically, it's not. I put in a red, a, a blue trend line, uh, which is not very useful, but it is there. And you see that the prediction is complete, well, bad. So it does run, that's good. It took 60 hours to run. I had a thousand epochs, a thousand learning cycles. But I'm unsure about the learning trajectory. Like, was it already done learning? Like, was the was the latent layer already doing a nice dimensionality reduction? And from that, were the phenotypes already had the solid base to be trained upon? Th that that's unsure. We don't. We I didn't plot it at that time yet. So the reason that this result is just noise is because the gene for Andromedalin is monogenic and is only containing out of only exists out of 52 amino acids and um, so we had three we, we picked one in 3000 SNPs and only a subset of that um, by chance we won't. We have 50 chances out of 3,000, so that is 1 in 60 chance of hitting it, or 1 in 600. One of so, that it, it was just, well, bad luck. No, this is the luck as expected. But the cool thing is it worked. So now we can do smarter things. And the smarter thing is to instead use random SNPs, use the SNPs known to have an association. For example, or that 5 megabase downstream and upstream around known cis regulatory elements. Uh, that's a to do list. The hashtag 5 means that I made an issue on GitHub about this. So, because there is an article about this by uh, Julia Hoeglund et al. in my group that already did a quantitative trait analysis. <coughs> and here you see the genetic association found with some proteins. So I can just use that data, and with some luck, after a while. So one of the things on chromosome 11, there will be uh, the gene for adrenomedulin. They did not detect it, like it's chopped off, but it's it's not detected. And I think it's also more here. But maybe GCA can detect an association, but we don't know. So that's one thing to do, use challenging data. But one other aspect is about learning. So here we have Xun Tsi. He was the third most important Confucianist philosopher that lived around 300 before Christ. And he says, learning proceeds until death, and only then does it stop. So of course that, that's very wise. But for a neural network, after a while we want it to, to be done learning and stop. We can't let a neural network learn, well, forever. Uh, because within our lifespans we would like to get our results. So we need to see how well it is learning and how well it is doing and when it has learned its stuff. So I want to visualize the learning trajectory that the neural network with the addition goes through. And there will be some scores that indicate how well the neural network has learned that should increase through time. And there, are, there will be two scores. One will be how well the dimensionality reduction is doing. And one score will be how well the phenotype is predicted from it. Now I feel that it should be... This is just an imaginary thing. There's some nice curves. I, I put lots of here. But the dimensionality production, uh, reduction can immediately start and do, uh, do its job. But the phenotypic trait prediction builds upon that. So at the start, when the dimensionality reduction is, is bad, it has no like solid ground to learn upon. Because the, 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 the autoencoder itself is learning still so much 
that it has no solid ground. But when the autoencoder, when the dimensionality reduction goes nicely, then I would say the trade prediction can take off and do a better and better job. So the dimensionality reduction score is already in the original autoencoder. And actually this is a picture from the article where it was presented in where it plots an F1 score, which is I'll describe later. It's how well it performs, whereas one is best. Um, they used four different methods. I'll only focus on GCAA here, which is the black line. They used a number of nearest neighbors. Here they used three, they also did for 20. But I'll also discuss the number of nearest neighbors. And they used a certain amount of dimensions, which is the number of neurons in the latent layer. And you can see that it varies a bit in this in this case. These are three things I tweak. Maybe you'll see I'll, I'll remove actually this whole thing. But I will definitely tweak the number of dimensions. Because I can imagine that two dimensions is too few for real data. But I'll first discuss what an F1 score is and these uh, three nearest neighbors is. And for that I will take it to a whole different context. Uh, then we'll go back to genetic data. So first let's use a different context. So the different context is a classifier. So let's say a classifier can be for example a neural network. And here we have a data set of 30 emails. And of those emails we know if they are spam or not. And our neural network is trained to detect spam email. And the higher this classification score is, the, the more it believes that this email is indeed spam. So, so, the, so that's the contact of a classifier. It needs to say, is it spam, yes or no. And the F1 score is a metric for the trade-off between precision and recall. So now this discuss precision and recall based on this data, on, on this data with calculations, but keep in mind, so when we have this data set, where would you put a threshold for, for, um, for the human to send an email to his spam box or his inbox? If you set the classifier, if you set the, this threshold, so above the threshold you say this is spam, and for most messages this is spam, but here we have two messages that are not spam that end up in the spam box. So th the classifier should be a bit, bit there, but not too much there. On the other hand, if you put the classifier more to the left, then all, um, then all the emails, uh, but there are also some spam emails getting in the inbox. And wherever you put it, it's bad. And the metric, the F1 score, is like, like the trade-off between those two. So the precision, uh, F1 score, trade-off between precision and recall. The precision is how often the classifier is right, which is based on the number of true positives of L estimated positives. So due to this line, th this threshold, be above it there are 10 emails. About 8 of them are indeed spam emails. So that's the precision, 8 out of 10. The recall is how often are the positive cases recognized as such. Like it know it, it has been trained to know spam. So if you give it 11 spam emails, then how often will it say that those are indeed spam? How good does it recall the spam emails? Well, it had 11 spam emails trained, it's trained on 11 spam emails, and only 8 out of 11 are correctly recalled. So that's recall. And you want, if you want to put your, your, your threshold line, you want to put it somewhere in between those. Because the higher you put the threshold to the right for precision, the more you put it to the right, your precision goes up. But the more you put it to the right, your recall goes down. Because at the if you put it the classification score at the right-hand side, all emails are classified as spam. 
all emails classified as spam are spam, yes, but you have a lot of spam in your inbox. If you put the classification score too low, then all emails known to be spam are classified as spam. Um, but all uh, l more inbox messages get to the spam box as well. So it's more prone to, to label things spam. And the F1 score is exactly uh, the harmonic mean be to between those two uh, scores. It's a harmonic mean similar to, um, to, to for example, velocities. It's not the, the regular mean that you need to use the harmonic mean here because they're more like rates and or velocities instead of um, regular values like distances. So that's the F1 score. The F1 score, the higher it is, the better. But they also showed in the original picture, the F1 score, the higher the better, the number of nearest neighbors. So for that, I will switch to another context. So we just talked about classifying spam and why F1 scores, or how they work. Now we're going to classify uh, individuals and, and let's keep it a bit close by so these are genotypes of individuals from three different countries the red country the blue country and the green country and how well does this um, does this has this class how has this separation worked how good is this classification like they are separated a bit there's some overlap but how are we going to quantify how well these individuals are are ordered, are arranged, are, are classified, are, are clustered. Well, one nonsensical way, uh, it, it's very prone to overfitting, is that you say, well, we are going to take points, and uh, the individuals that we classify them as green, blue, are blue, uh, and, and so on, and that the area around it uh, belongs to the individuals that are from the n one nearest neighbor. Um, for example, here we have blue and directly in between, in the middle is the, the boundary shift. That means if we have a new individual, uh, that would be a bit above this blue dot, we would say this is a blue one. And if it's a bit below the red, we say this is a red one. Um, also, there uh, here are no errors. All dots are in their own territory, so to say. But you can see that there are some dots, for example here, this red one, or this blue one. They they are the singletons in, in, in another territory, for example, the green territory here. But it appears that this blue individual is in the space of, of the green individuals. So maybe we should use more neighbors instead of just one to determine which area is where the individuals should be from, where we predict the individuals are from. So here we use five nearest neighbors to determine which area the individuals are from. And the more nearest neighbors you use, the more likely you are to overgeneralize or maybe correctly generalize. I, it's just more prone to generalization, but maybe five is the correct call here. We don't know with more information. So here we generalize a bit more, that's for sure. So uh, so now this, this this blue singleton is now in the green territory. We see that there's a misclassification here. Um, but at least there's some generalization going on. And also what's new is, is territory that's undetermined. For example, here we have uh, here we have some white area. And this area is undetermined who it is, whose it is, because this one has two red and two green and one blue nearest neighbor. And by a majority vote, we decide what an infant should be classified in. And in this case, we can't decide because there's as much red as there are green individuals neighboring this space. So that is the number of neighbors which helps you to see how well your classifier works, your classifier. The problem is how much neighbor should you use. This is K is used to con as a convention for the number of nearest neighbors because it's the K nearest neighbor algorithm. 
that's hard to say a priori you can possibly determine it from data uh, by calculating the k with the lowest error for example the stack overflow gives some unreferenced advice um, but this is uh, not very useful also in our context we cannot assign clusters because the North Swedish population health study is approximately one cluster which are the villages Karasuwando and Sopero um, where Karasuwando is the first one and Sopero is a, is a village that was added later it's, but it's very close by so it will be very hard to cluster just on those two villages let's say we have a cluster Karasuwando individuals and a cluster Sopero individuals on the other hand, all we care about is that we can see that the dimensionality reduction has reached its equilibrium. Uh, and we don't care exactly um, the, the amount, uh, the, the k, the amount of uh, nearest neighbors, as long as we can see it goes to equilibrium. But on the one hand, maybe we only care about the trade predictions anyway. Like we know that the trade predictions, they piggyback on the dimensionality reduction, like we need to have a solid dimensionality reduction before the trade predictions make sense. But maybe we don't care about the dimensionality reduction too much. And that's why I put the Titanic in here. Like if you want to, like if you go to the movie Titanic, it's not about the ship. Uh, you don't see the engine room at all. It's mostly about the humans. So hence the Titanic. So let's zoom in on the trade prediction scores because we need to quantify this how well does the prediction go then how well does it go in time and I want it in a way to that I can compare protein or protein concentration I wanna uh, I wanna so I can look for proteins that are better predictable uh, but if their ranges from concentrations differs between two proteins then I, I want a way that 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 the range of protein concentration doesn't matter if it's in picomolar or nanomolar or whatever. So this is the context. We have a true phenotype now. We have a predicted phenotype. Ideally, it's on this line. So if all the points are on that line, the, the trade prediction score should be should be either very high or very low. And the more they deviate from that, uh, things must change. Well, the obvious first candidate is to use the mean squared error, which is um, the mean of the vertical distance to the identity line squared. So you, for each point, distance to the vertical line, square it, take the mean of all those, and then, uh, then you have the mean squared error. The problem is, however, that the scale matters. So if you use different um, concentrations for example like picomolar or nanomolar matters if you use Kelvin or Celsius matters and I want to be able to compare everything so then I simply use a normalized mean squared errors um, I put some R code here how I do that I felt that's the easiest one like you take the true values which is a numeric factor and you take the mean of that from the true values, you also take the standard deviation of that. Standard deviation should be bigger than zero, else it doesn't make sense. Then, of all the true values, you extract the mean, and of all what's left, divide it by the standard deviation. So it's rescaled to be to have a mean of the mean, and I have a standard deviation of this SD. And you do the same transformation on the estimated value, which is a numeric vector of the same length. And then you have both of them in the same normalized range, whatever the range was. I asked, I asked Torgny, our statistician, he said it was a great idea. I checked it doesn't matter for the scale at all, so that's great. The full code is here. Um, so I think that makes sense to use that. So let's do some progress that I've been doing. So at the moment I can plot the F1 scores through time for the different amount of numbers of neighbors um, I'm happy I can do this. This plot, however, it was using the trivial data, the, the, the oversimplified data, so it doesn't make sense to, to look to at it too much, but I'm happy I can now plot it on when I use real data. Also the learning trajectory, so I want to see the, the 
how much it how well it predicts the phenotype. Well, and I can plot this now in time. So I'll show you. It's it's here. So you can see for the different epochs. Make it bigger. You can see for the different epochs for the true phenotype and the predicted phenotype how well it does. You see that it overlaps and it, it's it's also trivial data here. But what's already weird is I would expect these points to go to to the diagonal. They don't. They just go down first. So that is interesting in its own way, but it's not the most interesting thing. Ideally, I want to see the normalized mean square error through times, which I have not done yet. I'm working on that as we speak. So as a conclusion, the autoencoder needs a hard problem. Uh, you you can't underwhelm it with with trivialities. Hence, we're going to use the North Swedish Public Health Study with useful genetic regions. We need to determine when it is done learning, and for that we need to select the device measures for that. And finally, the autoencoder then probably needs tuning. At the moment, the latent layer has two neurons, hence two dimensions, so that's also for plotting. But the autoencoder may underfit real challenging data. So we know from some articles that they use, I think, 140 principal components. That's the max I've ever read. Um, so if you need 140 principal components, then cutting it to two non-linearly related ones is maybe a bit too much. So we need real data and, and tune it a bit. So we don't still not know where or when the autoencoder outperforms existing methods. But we can predict that it might be, might do so when the data have sufficient complexity, especially when there's a non-linear relationship between the principal components, because then it can be the PCA, the principal component analysis. There must be common alleles. On rare alleles, it doesn't work. And probably if the data is noisy, because autoencoders are good with uh, handling noisy data. So that is my presentation. Like you can you can find my present my uh, presentation here as well as well as this video, and you can use everything there. So normally I would have time for questions. We don't because this is a YouTube video. So I wish you a very good day. Cheers.